I'm Roy Lee Lindsay with the North Carolina Pork Council, and I want everyone to remember, bacon makes everything better. Welcome to the Old North State Tailgate, presented by NC Pork. I'm Chris Edwards. Great to be with David Glenn. Thanks for tuning into our show today. Please subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening to us on, whether that's YouTube or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Music, iHeart. We really appreciate your support of our shows. And don't forget to tell your friends about the Old North State Tailgate as well. Don't forget about the DG Show coming up this Thursday at 9 a.m. This week's featured guest, Mike Jacobs, the head football coach, at Lenoir Ryan. We'll talk more about LR coming up in our show today. All right, DG, time to break the huddle presented by the original Saltworks. A lot to get to from games last week. Let's start with the big one in Raleigh, NC State knocking off North Carolina 39 to 20, a dominant effort by Dave Dorn and the Wolfpack. Yeah, this is fascinating to me because remember when Mac Brown returned to Chapel Hill, he not only won the first two head-to-head -head matchups against Dave Doran, the Tar Heels absolutely whooped the Wolfpack in those two games. Since then, obviously, it's been Wolfpack win, Wolfpack win, and now a third straight Wolfpack win. And whereas the first two pack wins were nail biters, this one was a curb stomping. And my bottom line, Chris, was that NC State, think of it in the big picture, was the physically tougher team meaning the Wolfpack players mostly won the battle at the line of scrimmage. Many of the one-on-one -on -one battles downfield, say between a wide out and a cornerback, UNC's running back, Omarion Hampton, who entered the game as the leading rusher in the entire nation against the stud linebacker, Peyton Wilson, and his friends on the Wolfpack defensive front, Hampton had only nine carries for only 28 yards. Similarly, UNC's famous wide receiver, Tez Walker, who just made the All-ACC team that was announced earlier this week, often matched against the really physical Wolfpack corner, Aiden White, who also earned All-ACC honors this week. Tez Walker had only two catches for 29 yards with a couple drops and I would argue some alligator arms along the way. Meanwhile, UNC's quarterback, Drake May, one of the top quarterbacks in the nation, Wolfpack sacks him twice. Peyton Wilson had one of those. They pressured him countless times by dominating in the trenches. They intercepted him twice. They caused him to fumble on one of his scrambling runs. To me, all of that reflects physical toughness. And the pack had more of that than the heels. But also, I thought State was the more mentally tough team. Meaning, how did the players manage their emotions or react to the last bad thing that happened in this great rivalry game? Carolina seemed a little intimidated by some combination of the Wolfpack players on the field or the Carter-Finley crowd by the field. And the Tar Heels, who, by the way, are the most penalized team in the entire Atlantic Coast Conference this season. They had nine penalties for 99 yards against the Pack, most of them mental mistakes, many of them at crucial times, often throwing Drake May and that offense kind of behind the chains. Meanwhile, there was a point in that game where the Wolfpack's defense gave up not one, not two, but three consecutive touchdown drives. And on one of them, Drake May comes out. And Chris, there are four plays taking up 75 yards, ending a Carolina touchdown, where Drake May diced and sliced and dissected and absolutely tore up four plays, 75 yards, touchdown, the Wolfpack defense. Three straight touchdown drives. What did the Wolfpack do in the aftermath of that? Didn't panic, didn't complain, didn't stray from the game plan, didn't make excuses, didn't point fingers at each other. They stuck to the game plan, they kept playing, and they won convincingly in the end, 39 to 20. To me, that reflects mental toughness. There was not a significant talent disparity on the field at Carter-Finley Stadium in this year's State Carolina game. Sometimes there is in favor of one team or the other. This was mostly an even talent matchup. When teams are mostly even in talent and even experience, it usually comes down to things like preparation and discipline and poise and football IQ and execution and mental toughness and physical toughness. And this year, I'd argue that the pack was better at all of those things. And that is why they won the game by such a lopsided margin in the end. That is both a credit to Dave Doran of NC State and in my eyes, a fair criticism of Carolina coach Mac Brown. 
Mac deserved the credit for those two dominating Carolina wins a few years ago. Dave Doran deserves a lot of credit for the Wolfpack swinging that pendulum back in their direction and now winning three in a row. We'll have more on that game and more on the coaches coming up in our next segment. All right, our next game we want to talk about from last week. Richmond uses a big second half to beat NC Central 49-27. to Great season for Coach Oliver and the Eagles, though. Yeah, disappointing end, but another very good season for Coach Trey Oliver and the Eagles. They did share the MIAC title, remember? Howard is headed to the Celebration Bowl instead of the Eagles because of a head-to-head tiebreaker. And the Eagles' trip to Richmond, remember, despite – ending with a loss, it did make history because this was the first ever FCS playoff game for NC Central football. It did not end the way they wanted it to, obviously, but a 9-3 and record is going to be good enough for a second consecutive finish in the postseason FCS top 25 whenever that vote comes out. And it's another impressive accomplishment for a program that, remember, has been only playing at the FCS level for 13 years now. One final bouquet on that one. Central senior quarterback Davius Richard, not an exaggeration, one of the greatest players in the history of the school. He threw it well against Richmond for the most part. He ran it well and scored several touchdowns on the ground against the Spiders. He just did not get enough help in the end from his teammates for this to be an even more special season than it was. But credit to Richard for an amazing career, credit for Trey Oliver for really building this central program to the best it's ever been at the FCS level. And then to finish up the FCS thought, it's at least from our perspective of the Old North State tailgate and traveling sports circus, it was Mercer with a 17-7 to win over the running Bulldogs of Gardner-Webb. Yeah, and unfortunately for the running Bulldogs, they not only lost this game, they lost their head coach. Uh, Trey Lamb, one of the youngest Division I head coaches in the country at only 34 year old, years old, recent guest here on the North Carolina Sports Network, He spent four seasons in Boiling Springs, and he built that program to the point where it just won back-to-back Big South championships, and that's how they made back-to-back FCS playoff appearances, the running Bulldogs. Those are huge steps in the right direction for the program. But as we've seen, whether it's Dukes, Mike Elko, other successful head coaches in our backyard or elsewhere, of course, when you win at a high level, other people notice. And in this case, East Tennessee State of the Southern Conference came calling for Trey Lamb after his season recently ended, and he's already been introduced as the new head coach of the Buccaneers. For anyone who may be wondering, whereas ETSU is not viewed as a prominent FCS job, it is considered a big step up in the FCS pecking order when you leave the Big South for the Southern Conference. Just to give a quick high-level college basketball comparison, when Kevin Keats left a really good UNC Wilmington program of the CAA for NC State of the Atlantic Coast Conference, that's a step up the ladder, even though they're both Division I leagues, right? Similarly, these are both FCS programs, but the Southern Conference, where ETSU lives, is considered higher level FCS football than the Big South, where uh, Gardner-Webb lives, at least for now. All right, let's talk about a couple teams still playing, DG, and we'll start with Appalachian State. The Mountaineers, a 55-27 win over Georgia Southern last week. The Mountaineers have won five in a row, and they finished the regular season eight and four. They'll play for a Sun Belt title this week against Troy. Chris, I was a youth soccer coach for a long time, and one of the things I would say to my players, whether we were in first place, and there were examples of that, or last place, and there were examples of that, I would say, guys or ladies, We're going to be better by the end of this season than we are at the start. That's one of our goals. And yes, we look at the scoreboard and yes, people talk about the record, but we're not going to leave this patch of grass as we found it, right? And to me, there is no better example in the entire country in the sport of college football of a team improving more dramatically from September to November than this Appalachian State Mountaineers team. And that is a hats off tribute to head coach Sean Clark, his staff, and his players, because obviously they stuck to the plan. They didn't panic. They didn't point fingers when they were, remember, three and four at midseason. And that's a year after they went six and six at a school that has been used to a much higher level of football success for a long, long time. That dominating win over Georgia Southern last Saturday, 55-27, it was the Mountaineers' fifth straight win and it put them in the Sun Belt Conference championship game. They'll play at Troy University in Alabama on Saturday. 
with that title on the line. We'll get to the matchup a little bit later. But for now, let's just say that both the App State offense and the App State defense have improved dramatically over the past three months. They put up 48 points to beat Southern Miss. They annihilated Marshall on both sides of the ball in a 31-9 win. They dominated on the road at Georgia State a couple weeks ago, 42 to 14. They just curb stomped Georgia Southern in the game we mentioned from Saturday. And in the midst of all that, remember, they went to 10 and 0 at the time, James Madison, and beat the highly regarded Dukes 26 to 23 in overtime on the Dukes home field. For now, let me just add this final fun fact on the Mountaineers. Fun fact. App State's quarterback, Joey Aguilar, you are a seasoned veteran, Chris. You may already know this, but for the rest of the viewers and listeners, Joey Aguilar started this season as the backup quarterback in Boone. He now has 33 touchdown passes this season. The only two FBS quarterbacks in the entire country with more touchdown passes this year than Joey Aguilar, the junior college recent arrival at App State are named Jaden Daniels of LSU and Bo Nix of Oregon. Those two guys are probably going to be in New York as Heisman Trophy finalists. The next name on that list is Joey Aguilar of App State. That is just a stunning accomplishment for that young man and that offensive coaching staff. So one more bouquet of roses for the Mountaineers. And how about our friends at Lenore Ryan? They beat Benedict 35-25 in the D2 playoffs last week, and the Bears just keep rolling along, DG. Incredible. And you mentioned uh, Lenore Ryan head coach Mike Jacobs, my guest this week on the David Glenn Show. He's a really interesting guy, so I hope folks will check out that interview on our YouTube channel. Coach Jacobs played his college football at Ohio State University while his own dad was an assistant coach for the Buckeyes under a coach many will remember, John Cooper. Much like those and other Ohio State teams, Lenore Ryan loves to run the ball down your throat. And the Bears also play elite defense most weeks. As the old saying goes, a quality running game and a quality defense both tend to, quote, travel well in football. And sure enough, they did over the weekend at Benedict. This fun fact actually surprised me, even though we've been celebrating this Lenore Ryan team for a couple months now. Until last Saturday, Chris. Despite significant historical success as a Division II power and really one of the most consistent winners at any level of NCAA football here in North Carolina, despite all that, Lenore Ryan had never won a true road game in the Division II playoffs. And last Saturday's opponent, Benedict, is located in Columbia, South Carolina, so it was a bus trip. Benedict had not lost a regular season games in more than two full years. And Benedict was 11-0 and ranked number four in the polls going into that matchup last Saturday against Lenore Ryan. Now Benedict's season is over, and it's the Bears who are moving on to another matchup that we'll discuss later. Well, that's going to do it for our first segment. Stay tuned. We'll have our Sport Clips MVP of the Week presented by Sport Clips coming up in our next segment. But as we head into break, here are all the scores from last week's games involving North Carolina college football teams with our Jimmy scoreboard right here on the old North State tailgate. Hey folks, David Glenn here. I cannot offer a greater endorsement or a bigger compliment than telling you about the folks that I use for important matters in my own life. That's the case with the Lawson Insurance Group, led by three actual brothers, Ken Lawson, Miller Lawson, and Michael Lawson. These guys operate a very successful family-oriented business right here in Raleigh, and that office happens to be one of those beautiful blends of NC State grads and UNC grads and graduates fans and supporters of other colleges and universities all over North Carolina. I know these guys, I trust these guys, and I send these guys my own insurance business and that of my family. The next time you have insurance needs, I hope you'll do the same. The Lawson Insurance Group is known for its commitment to community and its dedication to ensuring that North Carolinians and their businesses 
are prepared for life's inevitable challenges with the reminder that as a high street insurance partner, Lawson Insurance Group offers local expertise and support that combined with high street's extensive national resources means more choice and support for you as their client. As we speak, Miller Lawson's helping the Glenn family with our auto insurance needs and Ken Lawson is the guy to call for your commercial insurance needs. If you Google High Street Lawson Insurance, their website will be the first to pop up. All right, DG, time to get into our hot reads of the week presented by Lawson Insurance and High Street Insurance Partners. And let's start here. You alluded to this in our first segment. Coaches that can get their programs to the next level. Sometimes fans might be a little, I don't know, apprehensive, abrasive, whatever word you want to use about their current head football coach getting their program to what they think should be the next level. Yeah, it's a funny leftover from the Wolfpack's dominant victory over the Tar Heels at Carter-Finley. But I've been following this rivalry for 37 years. I've been covering the Dave Doran era for 11 years now. And I've been covering Mac Brown since 1988, if you count his first tenure in Chapel Hill. And what strikes me, once you get over the emotion of what just happened, and that was a Wolfpack dominating victory that that fan base should celebrate and that other fan base should complain about. But what strikes me as funny in a weird way is that even though the details are very different, Carolina fans' current complaints about Mac Brown's inability to get the heels to the next level, quote unquote, whether that means 10 wins in a season or an ACC title or whatever, they very much mirror what I have heard, not this week, obviously, but for much of the last 11 years from NC State fans about Dave Doran's inability to get the Wolfpack to the quote unquote next level. I say that the details are different because, as you know, Chris, Carolina fans mostly complain, and you could add to this list, but it's about a lack of toughness in the Tar Heels or poor preparation or poor co coaching that comes out through a lack of attention to detail or a lack of fire in a certain rivalry game or whatever, or sometimes it's about Mac being too much of a CEO, overseer, and not enough of a guy who actually teaches X's and O's or technique, or has assistants who focus on such things. Very different complaints about Dave Doran in, at NC State. And again, not right now, but over the years, it's been he's a mediocre recruiter. Uh, he had disappointing defenses for a while. He's had quarterback dysfunction in different years, including this one for a while. And for remember, until he started smoking cigars on national TV and dropping F-bombs occasionally and, you know, taking – challenging Steve Smith to a steel cage match, metaphorically, Dave Doran was often complained about by Wolfpack fans as, you know, a milk toast personality that could never rally the recruits and rally the fan base into something truly special, despite some eight and nine win seasons. Here's what cracks me up. Through 11 seasons at NC State, Dave Doran's average record, when you kind of shave the percentage points, his average record over 11 years at State is slightly better than seven and five. That's slightly better than the definition of mediocre, right? Some people would call it the definition of mediocre. Guess what? Through these past five seasons at UNC, you know what Mac Brown's average record is? It's slightly better than seven and five, which you could argue, call it better than mediocre, call it the definition of mediocre. Mac Brown remembers the winningest coach in Carolina football history. Dave Doran remembers the winningest coach in NC State football history. And yet I just told you that Mac's recent five-year resume and Dave Doran's 11-year resume, average records seven and five. And whereas Mac Brown has a winning record in conference play during this second tenure in Chapel Hill, 24 and 18, which is solid by historical standards. Believe it or not, after 11 years, and I know Wolfpack Nation is in celebration mode right now, but after 11 years, Dave Doran's ACC record is 44 wins and 46 losses. He's sub 500 as the in conference play as the winningest coach in Wolfpack history. Now, listen, there is, in my opinion, there's more good than bad for Dave Doran and Mac Brown. But I roll my eyes sometimes when either fan base draws too many conclusions about the last thing that happened, right? Mac's track record in the ACC, first tenure and second tenure, is significantly better in conference games than Dave Doran's over 11 years. And when Carolina curb stomped the Wolfpack two years in a row in 2019 and 2020, all of this was turned upside down. 
The bottom line to me is that while there are a lot of major differences between the two coaches in the rivalry, the two teams in the rivalry, the two fan bases in the rivalry, when you look at the school's bottom line results under their current coaches, the records are a lot more similar than you might think. And most of the conversation is so attached to the last thing that happened that most fans lose sight of that very, very, very even bigger picture. Well, let's continue is what I'm calling as the coaching world turns, DG. We've already got some movement this week, the first week of the off season, if you will, the bowl preparation season. Mike Elko bolting for Durham for Texas A&M and Mike Houston at ECU given another shot by the Pirates. Yeah, and we mentioned, obviously, Trey Lamb heading to East, East Tennessee State a little bit earlier. The Mike Houston story to me is relatively simple. He made a move to correct the biggest problem in the program by firing his offensive coordinator, who, again, is a beloved person in Greenville in most ECU circles. So hats off to Donnie Kirkpatrick for his long and impressive track record. But this was a train wreck offensively, and somebody miscalculated – on the, whether the, the uh, Pirates needed a quarterback in the transfer portal or the ability of the two guys who played quarterback for them this year, that was an absolutely abysmal, one of the worst in all of FBS football offenses. And it just weighed down what a team that was pretty good on defense at times, looked well coached in certain ways at times, battled and got better toward the end of the season compared to the beginning of the season. Mike Houston's bigger picture track record, Two straight bowls prior to this year with the Pirates, remember, two straight bowl invitations. And before that, I mean, a national champion at James Madison and a winner at the Citadel where hardly anybody wins and took Lenore Ryan 10 years ago to the Vision 2 national championship game. The best season in Lenore Ryan history, at least at the Division 2 NCAA level. That bigger picture suggests that Mike Houston deserves a little bit more time, at least in my eyes. So I think that was the right decision by ECU to, to give him a chance with a new offensive system, a new offensive coordinator, and in all likelihood, you know, a couple of new quarterbacks. Meanwhile, the Mike Elko situation. I know a lot of Duke fans are upset, but I want to remind people, and I'll give Duke fans credit. I'd say 90% of them, and you may observe this differently, 90% of them are not really beefing with Mike Elko's decision to leave Duke. They're really complaining about the details of his departure, right? A yep. Zoom conference with his former Duke players instead of man-to-man, -man, face to face, I gotta leave. Some say he should have a departing press conference. I'm not really big on departing press conferences. I'm not sure people why people obsess over that. It's incredibly uncomfortable to sit there and ask answer questions honestly, which is what people say they want, about why you're leaving Duke to go to Texas a and I'm not in favor of the departing press conference unless it's a retirement or, or another certain special circumstance. The, the details I'm not going to argue with. Mike Elko could have and should have handled the details of his departure better. But I want to remind everybody that we live in a big boy world. And it is Mike Elko's job, absolutely and without question, to say to his Duke fans and Duke players, I love it here. I'm committed to this place. I hope to build something here. My family loves it here. And now fans are trying to hold over Mike Elko's head certain statements that he made. Listen, you are the most naive fan on the planet when it comes to most coaches. If you interpret, my family and I love it here. We hope to build something special here. I'm committed to make this program great. If you interpret that, as I'll stay here forever under all circumstances, that is on you as a gullible, naive, and not very smart sports fan. There are rare cases, older coaches, sometimes a coach at his alma mater, other exceptions. There are rare cases where you know somebody's going to die or retire at their current school, right? That is the exception to the rule. Almost everybody else is willing to listen. And again, Mike Elko didn't handle the details of his departure in the best way. At the same time, please keep in mind, there are years where Duke, recent years, where Duke averaged 15,000 or so in home football attendance. 15,000 people or so at the FBS level. When Texas A&M is mediocre 
There are years where their home average football attendance is near 100,000 people. Oh, by the way, Mike Elko was making $3 million and change at Duke. He's going to make $7 million a year plus incentives at Texas A&M. Oh, by the way, Duke's football revenue per season is roughly one half of Texas A&M's football revenue per season. And there are all sorts of other details that would make virtually any coach leave Duke football for Texas A&M football or a lot of other jobs out there. Duke's academics make it harder. It's small stadium make it harder. The uh, lack of history, you know, one top 25 season in the last, you know, 50 or 60 years, it's about as bad as it gets in major college football. I would argue celebrate the great things and good things Mike Elko did for two years, but try not to be gullible, try not to be naive, try not to splice quotes as if a coach is somehow over his two years with the Blue Devils supposed to say, like he's supposed to answer a press conference question. Yeah, my family loves it here, but I would leave for a higher paying job. Yeah, I'm committed to build something special here, but there are other places where it's easier to win. I mean, keep in mind, this guy's got financial security for life now. Mm -hmm. Even if he gets fired four years down the road, he's going to have made 20 plus million dollars in guaranteed money plus bonuses. Um, this is the right decision for Mike Elko. There's no doubt in my mind. And, and one last thing, remember that coaches are competitive people and they turn their lives upside down to recruit and try to win football games and try to build a winner the way Mike Elko just built a winner over two years at Duke. When you pour that much of yourself into any enterprise, any endeavor, you want the largest possible platform, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the guitarist and singer graduates from the local dive bar and wants to play in bigger arenas or maybe even stadiums. The local sports radio host wants maybe the, the small town, then the big town, then the regional platform, then the national platform. When you pour as much as your, of yourself and your time, and they're well paid. I mean, I'm not feeling sorry for these guys, but they do empty the effort bucket in a way that turns their lives and families upside down. When you do that, you feel the urge to play in front of 100,000 instead of 15 or 30 or 35 or even 40,000 occasionally at Duke. You feel the desire to, to be paid at the highest level. You feel the desire to test yourself in the best league in America, the Southeastern Conference, most of the time in football. I know it's more complicated than everything I just said, but, but that's my bottom line. Beat up Mike Elko if you want for not handling that departure perfectly. But also, please keep in mind, there's no way in today's world he could have coached the Blue Devils bowl game, period. You, you cannot serve two masters under the current rules. It's ridiculous to ask a coach to do that. You're supposed to be all in on preparation for bowl opponent X while all in to get Texas A&M ready for departing transfers in the portal, which is here. Incoming transfers, you got to evaluate those guys who fits your system. What about evaluating the current AM players? He knows some of them because he was an assistant there. There's a lot going on. And anybody who doesn't appreciate the urgent nature of Mike Elko's arrival at AM and hit the ground running necessity for the Aggies, they just don't understand modern college football, especially the way the portal and signing day and those other complications work these days. Well, it's time to dive deeper into college football with our Sport Clips MVP of the Week presented by Sport Clips. And to talk all things college football, we send it over to Mike Waddell and the coach, Jimmy Collins. Guys, let's get right to it. What's next at Duke? Mike Elko is off to Texas A&M. Interim coach is Trooper Taylor. Does Duke stay in-house? Do they go out of house? Do they go for an on-hands coach or do they go for a CEO? Well, it's interesting uh, which which path they will follow. Obviously, they had to do this two years ago when they when they turned to Mike Elko. But I, I, I think as they move to it, Mike has done such a good job there that that uh, that it would open the possibility of an in-house guy. But I think they have to go outside just because of the things that are going on in the world of the transfer portal and in recruiting in general this day and time. That takes us to our second point. If you're a coach right now, the CEO of a major college football program, do you focus more on recruiting high school kids that need to develop, or do you go into the portal and get people who are already proven entities? 
Uh, Mike, I think that's, there's a combination there. If you look at Florida State, who is, uh, has the possibility of playing for a national championship, 17 of their starters are transfers. Uh, so some, some mixture of high school recruiting and, and, uh, and the transfer portal, I think, are critical this day and time. Now, if you're the Alabamas and the Georgias and, and those people of the world, you can make a living because you're selecting. You're not recruiting. They select the players that they want. But even those programs still use the transfer portal to plug gaps in their team each year. When you look at the budget implications of going into the portal, who's to say that somebody's worth this much or that much? Last year, Sam Hartman got $2 million to go to Notre Dame. How do you set a budget and say a linebacker's worth this, a lineman's worth this, but a quarterback is worth $2 million? Well, Mike, I think you have to go back to uh, uh, and reference the NFL, and all you have to do is look at the NFL draft at this point in time and see who gets picked in the higher rounds, uh, uh, the first pick, whether it, it be the first pick or the 32nd pick of the first round. Who dominates the first round? Quarterbacks dominate the first round. Defensive linemen dominate the first round. So uh, that answers your question. You got to be able to control the ball with a quarterback, and we all know it takes a quality quarterback, but you got to be able to rush that quality quarterback also. So to me, those are the two most critical positions in football. Two quarterbacks had a great season this year in North Carolina college football. We're talking about Riley Leonard, who had season-ending surgery, didn't play the last four or five games of the season following that terrible injury against Notre Dame. And Joey Aguilar out of Appalachian State both have time remaining. It's a foregone conclusion in a lot of people's mind that Drake May is already headed to the NFL draft. So when you look at Aguilar at Appalachian State and Riley Leonard at Duke, do you think either one of those guys after this type of season that they've had in 2023 will be back in Boone and Durham next year? Well, Mike, that, that projection is hard for me to do at this point in time because uh, I, I think they're going to have opportunities whether they decide that their current team and their current roster that they're a part of is more important to them than the monies that are going to be out there. Then that, that's the question those two will have to answer. Uh, but I think they're going to be very tempted in this market to move somewhere else. My bet is? They're going to go where the money is and people in Boone at the top of the food chain. We're talking athletics director Doug Gillen and Nina King at Duke. They have to make a decision. Are they willing to spend to keep their talent on the roster? It'll be a lot of fun to watch and we'll be watching it. You and I right here until next time. That's Jim Collins. I'm Mike Waddell. Back to you, Chris. All right, Mike. Thanks so much. When we come back, David and I will go inside our XL moving and storage big four games of the week. That's next, right here on the Old North State Tailgate, presented by NC Port. Hey, folks, David Glenn here for Organize for Success. I am a better person and a more effective business owner for having known and learned from Emily Parks over many years now. Emily's company, Organize for Success, helps multi passionate business owners and executives bring harmony to all the layers of their lives from work to side projects, from friends and family to hobbies, community, and beyond. With Emily's help, you too can make every minute matter. She helps you determine what earns your time and how to efficiently accomplish what matters. One of the many things I love about Emily is that she doesn't impose her will on her clients. She listens to them. That way she can better help them cultivate the lives they want to live. You can set up a complimentary call with Emily today by visiting OrganizeForSuccess.com. That's Organize, F-O-R, Success.com. All right, DG, time to go inside our XL Moving and Storage Big Four Games of the Week. And we'll start with the big one out west, Washington, number three in the country, against fifth-ranked Oregon in the Pac-12 title game, the final Pac-12 title game. And this is basically a, a de facto quarterfinal for the college football playoff that starts later uh, this year. Yeah, that's well put, Chris. And I'm not going to dissect the X's and O's or the matchup of two teams 
that I don't see all that often, although they are very prominent. But I'll just say this reminder. If you make, as a conference, if you make the four-team version of the college football playoff, it's a $6 million bonus. And I actually believe, as crazy as this sounds right now, because the Pac-12 is in its last year of existence for what we know of the Pac-12 or what we think of the Pac-12, with everybody jumping, almost everybody jumping to other leagues, I actually think the Pac-12 is in the best position because – if number three Washington wins, well, the Huskies are still undefeated. There's no way they would be left out of the playoff. However, if Oregon, whose only loss, remember, was at Washington in a close game, if Oregon wins the rematch, becomes the 12 and one Pac 12 champion, they're not leaving out a 12 and one conference champion, Power Five, avenged their only loss, Oregon Ducks team. Uh, so, whereas, you know, the ACC is freaking out. If Florida State loses to Louisville, what happens, right? If the Big Ten, if Michigan loses to Iowa, I think it's bye-bye Big Ten. I don't think the Wolverines get the benefit of the doubt, and maybe neither does Ohio State sitting out there as a non-conference champion participant. Uh, meanwhile, Georgia, Alabama, and the SEC, of course, is going to be a heavyweight battle. Texas is a one-loss team that is the best of the Big 12. So, I think Oregon, who oddly, as the loser of the earlier matchup, the Dutch, the Ducks are about a 10-point favorite over the Huskies. Bottom line is, if I'm the Pac-12 commissioner, I'm really sad that my, my league is disintegrating, but I'm really happy that it's going to be one heck of a swan song. Are you going to agree with the folks out West and take Oregon? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. I think Oregon's the better team. I think Bo Nix might be the best player in college football. It wasn't his fault that the Ducks lost to the Huskies earlier this year. He is a phenomenal player. Um, Carolina fans have been saying, you know, that Bo Nix is doing at Oregon what Drake May should have been doing with the Tar Heels this season. And I'm not sure that's an unfair comparison. Uh, I like the Ducks in this game, and I think they will be one of the final four in that playoff. All right, let's talk about the ACC title game now. Number four, Florida State and Louisville, as you alluded to, a loss for the Knowles, disastrous for the folks in Charlotte. Yeah, one quick reminder, we have mentioned this in previous weeks on our uh, tailgate podcast, but these are the two ACC teams that hit the transfer portal hardest. Mm -hmm. So anyone saying or underestimating the, the impact of the transfer, transfer portal on major college athletics, man, the evidence is really against you at this point. I gave the example of the 11 most frequent starters for the Seminoles on offense this season. 10 of the 11 are major college transfers. That's just incredible. That's not a slight change to how we used to build college football programs. That is a turn the whole model upside down. You still recruit and develop high school players, and FSU has plenty of those guys. But 10 out of 11 on offense, I think it's 5 out of 11 on defense, plus plenty of backups. Uh -huh. uh, that is an incredible, hard-to-believe ratio. And both Mike Norvell of Florida State, who may have saved his job two years ago, by hitting the portal really hard for guys like Trey Benson, his star running back, Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson, his two star uh, wide receivers, but also the majority of his offensive line are guys who started or, or had all conference offers uh, or honors at a previous league. It's not recruiting high school. A lot of the time is, is an educated guessing game. It's harder to project those 17 and 18 years old. When you just saw a guy earn all Pac-12 honors or all Big Ten honors. It's not rocket science to say, yeah, he'd probably be pretty good here. That's why the portal can be even more valuable than the high school traditional recruiting faucet, if you will. Uh, but it's I, I do think that given no Jordan Travis for Florida State, he was voted the first team All-ACC quarterback this week. He, of course, injured, missed that win over the Florida Gators. It'll be Tate Rodemaker at the controls for the Seminoles. Louisville's quarterback is sixth-year senior Jack Plummer, who actually was behind Jordan Travis of FSU and Drake May of UNC in the voting for All-ACC. He was the third-team All-ACC quarterback. So it's a, it's a healthier Louisville team battling a Florida State team that's really only missing one key player, but it's the most important position on the field. Last thing, these are the only two schools – that played top 25 offense and top 25 defense all season long in the national rankings. You know, in our neighborhood, Chris, State played top 25 caliber defense, but was often horrific on offense. Carolina played top 25 offense most of the time, but was often horrific on defense. Louisville and Florida State, only two examples in a 14-team football league that really were well-balanced teams 
FSU 12 and 0, Louisville 10 and 2. If you're rooting for the ACC in air quotes, you are rooting for the Seminoles. Because remember, if Louisville wins, there goes the six million dollars that are attached to a bid to the college football playoff. I know there are some nervous about a 13 and 0 Seminoles team missing the playoff, even if they beat Louisville. That could happen. Uh, and I think the committee has even implied that it could happen. But there are so many other variables in play that now's not the time to worry too much about that scenario. So who you like in the game, the Knowles or the Cards? I actually like the Cards. Um, I would. This is one of those I'd back away from the betting window. I don't have a strong feeling either way. But to me, it's it's a relatively even matchup. If Jordan Travis were at the controls for the Seminoles, to me, he's such a decision maker. I mean, uh, the a difference maker, rather, duh, right? First team All-ACC quarterback that he would be the massive edge in favor of the Seminoles. He's not there, so it's a guessing game. Now, Florida State knows it's playing for its postseason life or its playoff life, I should say, but I saw Louisville lose to Kentucky. I know that was a disappointment to Cardinals fans. Um, I won't be surprised at either result, but anyone underestimating Louisville, you're doing so at your own risk. All right, how about the Appalachian State Mountaineers? At Troy this week in the Sun Belt title game, you remember last year. Now, these teams didn't play this season, but you remember the game last year in Boone where App State had to win on a Hail Mary final play of the game. College game day was there. The magical season was building in Boone. They ended up going 6-6, six and six, as we talked about, but a chance now for Appalachian State to get another conference title for Sean Clark. This reminded me a little bit of the Carolina at State game that we just saw because – Carolina, I know they face planted, but their whole body of work suggests that they're an elite offense. State has been bad offensively at times. Their body of work suggests that state is an elite defense. And of course, state was home in that matchup against the Tar Heels. Similarly, I think percentage points separate the top teams in the Sun Belt offensively, but basically the Mountaineers led by Joey Aguilar, did I mention that only two quarterbacks named Jaden Daniels and Bo Nix have more quarterback, more, more uh, touchdown passes than Joey Aguilar's 33 so far this season. I, I still can't get that out of my head. The, the Sun Belt's leading offenses are essentially tied at 33 or 36 points per game, and the Mountaineers are one of those two. They're running the ball with multiple guys. They're throwing the ball to multiple guys, and Aguilar has just been, to me, one of the pleasant surprises in the entire state of North Carolina. Meanwhile, though, and maybe it comes down to another Hail Mary scenario, uh, Troy plays by far the best defense in the Sun Belt Conference. Now, we saw in Wolfpack Tar Heels, it was the defense at home in front of its own fans that tilted the scales against that elite offense. You know, obviously, I'm rooting for the opposite of that with an in-state team, App State, uh, traveling to Alabama to face the Troy Trojans. Your guess is as good as mine on this one. I've seen the Mountaineers a lot more than I have seen Troy, but that the Mountaineers have won five games in a row. And as I mentioned earlier, Chris, they're way better in November than they were in September. And that's why if you force me to make a pick, I'll take the Mountaineers. I don't even remember the line on this game. Not going to be easy to win on, a road, on the road against that defense, but I'll take the Mountaineers to win their sixth in a row. All right, the final game in our XL Moving and Storage Big Four Games of the Week. The Division II playoffs continue for the Bears of Lenore Ryan. They will be at Valdosta State this week. Yeah, Valdosta State, remember, came up earlier this year because the current coach at Western Carolina, Kerwin Bell, actually led Valdosta State to the Division II National Championship back in 2018. Uh, and, of course, that was one of the things that attracted Western Carolina to him a few years later, and now he's built a really on-the-rise FCS program there in Cullowhee. Uh, the difference here, Lenore Ryan's never won the Division II championship at the at the NCAA level. Valdosta State has won four of the last 18 Division II national titles, including most recently that one in 2018 under Kerwin Bell. But again, I hope folks will check out my conversation with Lenore Ryan head coach Mike Jacobs. They run the ball against virtually everybody. They're one of the best defensive teams in the nation. And they are on the road. Uh, 12, Valdosta State is 12 and 1, and Lenore Rhine is 12 and 1. This is the Elite Eight for those who have not followed the Division II playoffs. Lenore Rhine has already posted two straight wins, one of those two on the road, as we mentioned earlier. That was a new uh, horizon for the, the Bears program in their history. 
Um, this is a 500 mile road trip. Coach Jacobs told me that I think he said the NCAA threshold for allowing you to get on a plane instead of bus rides is 600 miles. So uh, <laughs> uh, Hickory, North Carolina and Valdosta, Georgia are roughly 500 miles uh, apart. So it's going to be a two day separated by a hotel stay trip from Hickory to Valdosta. I don't think either team has a huge advantage personnel wise. Uh, I don't know if Lenore Ryan can run the ball against Valdosta the way they've been able to run it against everybody else. But with each win, Mike Jacobs, now in his fourth year with the Bears, gets closer and closer to one of the best seasons the Bears have ever had. The landmark is 10 years ago. Mike Houston, now at ECU, took the Bears to the Division II National Championship game. Obviously, these Bears are a couple steps away from that. To me, it's an even matchup. Uh, I just wrote about this matchup. Uh, as well as the Sun Belt Championship game at ncsportsnetwork.com. If folks want to see the the written version that has some more details about the matchups, um, so I'm rooting for the Bears unabashedly, uh, and I'll I'll pick the Bears just for fun to get their second straight true road game victory in the D2 playoffs. That would be repeating history one week after making history. All right, time for us to get out of here. But before we do, it's time for DG's closing thoughts, presented by Organize for Success. So, Chris, I'm going to stray from football quickly here and share a quick story that I've already shared with you and our friend Mike Waddell. If your child is bitten by a cat and the emergency room at the local hospital tells you that the stray cat may have had rabies, but it's going to cost $15,000 to both admit your child to the emergency room and administer a rabies shot, $15,000, I'm not kidding, uh, let me advise you that there is not a single case of cat to human rabies transmission in the United States of America in the last 40 plus years. That factoid, and we love our fun facts here on the David Glenn Show and the Old North State Tailgate Podcast. I'm sharing that non-football factoid because it saved me $15,000. My daughter went to the, to the urgent care and she got it cleaned and she got the wound dressed and she got an antibiotic to make sure nothing's infected. If you're bitten by a bat, Chris, or a raccoon, or another animal, there's a much higher risk of rabies transmission to a human. Stray cats, much, 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 much lower risk. Ideally, you catch the animal, so then you can test the animal. There's not a human rabies test. So you have to catch the animal that bit you and test the animal for rabies. Well, we couldn't catch the cat. So... Uh, Somebody tossed me that tidbit about cat to human rabies transmission. I know it's not football related, but nothing else we've said today could save you $15,000 with the possible exception of the, the gambling element that we all like to dabble in from time to time. Uh, but overall, just a little uh, not so fun fact from the Glenn family travels and, and tribulations uh, that I hope will come in handy to some members of our audience at some point down the road and maybe save you $15,000. Well, I don't know how to follow that, so we're just going to wrap <laughs> up the show for this week. The Old North State Tailgate is an exclusive presentation of the North Carolina Sports Network, our foundational partner, the North Carolina Port Council. Thanks again to Mike Waddell and Jimmy Collins. For David Glenn, I'm Chris Edwards signing off for this edition of the Old North State Tailgate, the official tailgating soundtrack of the 2023 football season right here on the North Carolina Sports Network.